Hello, welcome to the New Stack Makers, a podcast where we talk about at scale application development, deployment, and management. Hey, it's Alex Williams with the New Stack here at MesosCon on a Friday morning with Paul Dix, the co-founder of InfluxDB, and we're here to discuss the tick stack. But before we do that, Paul, good to have you here, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about Influx Data, the company that you're the founder of. It's actually, you're the founder of Influx Data. Yeah, so I uh, started the company with my co-founder back in 2012. Uh, at first, we were building a SaaS application for do, doing real-time metrics and monitoring. Right. We went through Y Combinator in 2013, uh, and that product wasn't really taking off, but we saw that people were really interested in the infrastructure that we were building behind that application. So basically what we did is we took that infrastructure and we started open sourcing it as InfluxDB, the time series database, and then, the, then we built the other components of the stack over time. Excellent. And so today you're here at MexicoCon and you're going to be discussing the tick stack. Can you tell us what the tick stack is? Yeah, so the tick stack is our platform for working with time series data. Um, uh, I basically backed into the name, like I, I liked tick because I had done work uh, with time series data in finance, and a tick is basically like one, one like stock trade or whatever okay. in, a, in a time series in finance. Mm. So I thought, oh, it's for time series, so if the acronym was tick, that would be cool. Uh, That's probably so. where the name the ticker tape comes from, huh? Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so uh, basically, what we saw when we first released the database, uh, over the next six months as people started using it, we saw that people had to solve uh, common problems, right? They had to collect the data, they had to store it and query it, they had to process it and monitor it, and they had to visualize it. So uh, basically, we built a separate component for each of those things. T is for Telegraph, which is the data collector. It's basically an agent that you can deploy across all of your servers. That's a plugin, correct? Uh, it's an actual uh, binary that runs. Okay. Like it's a program that runs, and you deploy it to all of your servers. Okay. Your infrastructure. Um, uh, InfluxDB is obviously the time series database. Mm -hmm. um, Chronograph, which is the visualization piece. So you can do some dashboarding, but it also has stuff for working with the components of the stack, administering them, creating monitoring and alerting rules, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then there's Capacitor, which is basically a processing engine for time series data. So with that, you can do some basic ETL tasks, you can do monitoring and alerting, anomaly detection, uh, and it can send alerts to any one of like 20 different outputs, like Slack, email, Alerta, Victor Ops, PagerDuty, all that stuff. So that's the output then? Yeah, so and, and each, of, each of those components is open source, uh, Influx, Capacitor, and Telegraph are all MIT licensed. Chronograph is a GPL. So, uh, with, with you know, the, you know, the at the, at the administrative, you know, on, on the administrative, uh, you know, side of it, they can, you can be you can query then the tick stack and also then again you get the results back through that. Yes. Administrative environment. Yeah. So basically, Telegraph collects you know yeah, so telegraph, metrics, yeah. you know, time series me metrics like. Uh, CPU memory. It will collect uh, performance monitoring statistics about you know services that you have, like if you're running Nginx or Redis or Mongo or whatever, and then it will feed the data into InfluxDB. Uh, Capacitor can subscribe basically to a live stream of all the data that's going into Influx and basically monitor that data in real time. Uh, and then obviously with Chronograph, you can connect to it and either have just dashboards that you've created or you can drill down and dig into different pieces of the data. Now is it monitoring the applications or the, the components of the applications or is it monitoring? All, all of the above. All of the above. Yeah, it, it can be anything. So the use cases we see, obviously like server monitoring and application performance monitoring is one big use case. People use it for like business intelligence, like, base, like real time analytics. Um, like we've seen people in finance build uh, like real-time risk dashboards for the positions in their portfolio. Um, but uh, so real-time analytics is another big one. And then the other one is sensor data. 
So sensor data ends up looking, you know, IoT and all that stuff. That data actually looks very, very similar in structure to server monitoring data. The only difference is instead of, you know, your sensors being software in your applications and in your servers, your sensors are physical sensors out there in the world. So, so uh, in terms of like, uh, man, you know, so does it does it have the capability to manage, you know, to do monitor clusters then as well? Yes. Yeah. So we have. I mean, yeah, we have people monitoring their entire setups with it. So people doing monitoring for, you know, within AWS, their own data centers running Mesos, right? That's why I'm here is because uh, I'm going to be talking with a guy from Oracle, uh, Oracle Data Cloud, about how they're using Influx to monitor and the tick stack to monitor their, their infrastructure. What's the fit with Mesos? What is that? What is that? What is the story there? Um, there's nothing specific, just that we have, so within Telegraph we have um, plugins that can collect data about your Mesos installation, and we have plugins that can collect metrics from containers, right, and okay. servers, and, and basically it's just... Our, this is just the source. Yeah, exactly. Our goal is to essentially like get data from anywhere we can and get it into the system so that you can then like get intelligence from it, right? Uh, you can get insight, you can create monitoring and alerting rules and all that kind of stuff. Does the, does the data, so once you're collecting this data and you're analyzing it, um, and this is really for real time usage, but also batch, for batch data too, isn't it? Yeah, so capacitor works both for stream and batch modes. So stream is great for like that real time alerting, but there are some things where you want to do a batch, like you want to compare versus some previous period of time, mm -hmm. or you only want to do run the check like periodically, right? Once an hour or once a day. Um, another nice one that uh, Capacitor has is what we call a dead man switch. So basically that's if something stops sending data, trigger an alert, right? So like if a service all of a sudden stops sending data, that's an indication that it's it's dead. It's gone away. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, so the data you know is then able to be viewed through different monitoring platforms. Is that correct? And through PagerDuty, for example. And so other yeah, different like alerting platforms. So it can forward. It can trigger an alert and send that off to other systems, right? PagerDuty, Slack, email. Um, there are a bunch of different ones we we integrate with. So, uh, who are the people that you're finding are using this now? I mean, it's it's all over the place. I mean, we have we have customers globally, definitely users globally. Um, there are people. It's there's no specific industry vertical, right? I mean, there, systems administrators are they? So, de uh, oh, so software engineers are they? All of systems, the above. All of the above. Engineers? Yeah. So all of the above. Usually, what we find is so IoT is like a separate use case for in the IoT world and the sensor data world. That's primarily. Uh, developers, application developers that are using it as a platform to build their, you know, IoT application. Um, but the other common thing we see is uh, on the monitoring side of things is the systems administrators and DevOps people will start off with it and they'll deploy it broadly for server monitoring and basic application performance stat stats and then they will expose it as a platform for all application developers within a company to use. So then basically application developers have you know, a client library that they use in their code that sends data to Influx, which they can then monitor. I think the one company that really like exemplifies that kind of like metrics driven application development is um, Etsy. So they have a lot of, they're on their code is craft blog. They have a lot of posts over the last, you know, I don't know, like eight years, they're talking about how they're basically instrumenting everything in their stack, right? Not just the servers, but like any product feature that goes in, there's a metric that tracks it. And, and they can get insight into what's happening in there. So a lot you know a lot of people who read the news sector are very interested in the technical architectures that companies like yourself are building. What is that technical architecture underneath the tick stack that you've developed to be able to provide this scale and be able to bring in these different services that integrate in a manner so these software engineers and developers all can use it? Yeah, so on the open source side of things, right, basically we've, we've optimized Influx and Capacitor as much as we can to just be highly performant, right? We have we have people running a single like large beefy server that are tracking hundreds of thousands of measurements per second. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we've we've tried really hard to make that really performant and really scale well vertically. How have you done that? Like, what have you done to make it performant and scale? Uh, so vertically? the whole thing's written in Go. Okay. So one, we get a lot of wins be just because Go right. goes pretty fast. Right. Uh, but over time, the other thing we've done is Go has really really good profiling tooling. Right. So you can profile your code and you can like reduce allocations. So there's less GC overhead. All sorts of crazy things. Like uh, Go's been fantastic, and the thing is, like every release they have, they improve the garbage collector, they improve the performance. So we started the project, you know, back in 2013. But over the years, like things have just gotten faster, not just from our efforts, but from the efforts of the Go team, just right. making it better. Um, so that's on the open source side, uh, and then on the commercial side, we have like a scale out clustering product, right? So. It's basically a two-tier architecture, uh, it's just Influx Enterprise. It's basically the enterprise version of the database. Um, and you can have n number of what we call data nodes, which can process queries, store data, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, the interesting thing, at least for me, from a technical perspective, that we're going to be doing for this over the next 12 months is we're going to be migrating it to be kind of what I'd call like a cloud-native architecture, so that it's going to be designed to be run in ephemeral containers and uh, will serve, will basically create different services for different pieces of the stack, right? So we'll decouple the write pipeline from the indexing pipeline, from the query processing pipeline, from the monitoring pipeline, and we'll be able to scale those independently. That so. decoupling is really a key. Why is that such a key to scaling? Well, what is it that, that will do for you by decoupling? So it does a couple of things. One, it lets us develop each different component with different kinds of velocity, right? There's some things that, you know, you can have really high velocity and the risk of deploying a bug is lower, particularly like in user interfaces, right? You want your user interfaces to have high velocity. But a thing like a database, you don't want that to have high velocity. You want that to be fairly, fairly static. Right. Um, so it will do that. But the other thing is decoupling those things means you can scale each of those tiers independently, right? Uh, there, which is nice because like we have a bunch of different use cases that we support so not all of them have the exact same kind of workload and the other thing is like query processing for example uh, if you can scale your query processing independently like a lot of our query processing is really just users across an organization that have real-time dashboards up so what happens when they go home at the end of the day you're not throwing them any queries at the infrastructure right. so it's wasteful to have to have this massive infrastructure up if it's not being utilized. Exactly. And I've seen this I've seen this in large Cassandra and large HBase deployments where people will be running literally hundreds of servers and they have the hundreds of servers not because um, not because they need those servers to handle the processing and the like the right workload or the query workload. They have it just because they have a ton of data at rest and they just keep adding more and more servers to have more data. So the problem there is like the processing tier is actually intrinsically tied to the data storage tier and the two basically scale in lockstep. Decoupling those means that you can have cheap data so storage and very flexible like ephemeral processing. What about an event-based architecture or is this essentially a, a play on that? This is a play on that, yeah. This is definitely a play on that. Because, I mean, it's time series data, so a lot of time series data is events. When I think of time series data, I think of two different kinds of time series data. There's what I call regular time series, which is samples at fixed intervals of time. So sensor data looks like that. Uh, server monitoring data, like CPU, right? You'll take a CPU reading every 10 seconds or every minute. So that's regular time series. And then irregular time series is like event-driven data. So that could be individual requests to an API, right? What was the response time? Uh, it could be trades in a stock market. It could be events in an infrastructure, right? Container coming up, container shutting down, uh, alerts that get triggered, exceptions in an application, all that kind of stuff. What and about, we, yeah. we want our, our whole stack to work well for both kinds of data, right? For both for event-driven data as well as regular metrics time series. We're seeing a lot of interest in you know these these function-based environments, right? Yep. Serverless, so to speak. Yeah. Does that have a, a a role to play in your own architecture at all? In our architecture, not at the moment. Mm -hmm. It may in the future. The main role we would play is basically giving people visibility into how those things are performing and what those things are doing. Mm -hmm. so. 
Well, Paul, thank you very much. You have a presentation to give in, in just a little bit, but thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. It's been really interesting. Look forward to hearing about the evolution of your own architecture and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the maturity of the tech stack. Cool. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Great. Listen to more episodes of the New Stack Makers at the newstack.io slash podcast. Please rate and review us on iTunes, like us on YouTube, and follow us on SoundCloud. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. Thank you.